So, everybody, welcome. I'm uh, delighted to have this opportunity to share with you some of the information I picked up over the last, oh, well, quite some time, uh, having to do with change and managing change in organizations. My background uh, is, well, it started in higher education administration. That was my PhD. I worked in educational leadership, adult education and training. And uh, after about 15 years of that, working in international programs and traveling around the world and helping universities grow their international programs, I went to business and industry. I worked first at Microsoft for some time and, and helped them develop their international programs and change what they were doing, particularly in MSN. Uh, they were a very Redmond-centric operation uh, when I started there, and they were looking for somebody who knew a little bit about the international space. And, uh, and I had that experience. And the second language was Mandarin Chinese, and they wanted to do some work in China, so there I was. And I was very honest with them. I didn't know a server from a blender uh, when, when I got started with them, but they said, you do have what it takes, and that's a willingness to learn, and obviously you can learn, so they teach me the technology. And I learned what I needed to, uh, to uh, be successful in that operation. But there was a lot of change going on back then. Uh, and, and it really got me thinking about how that was managed or how it wasn't managed. But they weren't the only organization that was having challenges with that. Uh, some of my latest uh, seminars for private organizations is in the same topic area. So when I was asked uh, to consider a topic for this presentation, this conference today, well, change and change management was the one that uh, came to mind. But before I get too far into the material that I had in mind to present, I'd just kind of like to get the impression of what's your experience with change in organizations. Have you been through some changes in organizations ever? <laughs> or it's always been the same everywhere you've been? No, it's changed all the time. Mark says it's changed all the time. How so? Well, if your organization is bought out, this is my, my company was, uh -huh. and then I changed, I was with Washington Mutual, you know what happened to Washington Mutual, we did it to ourselves, so change took care of it. Right. Chief of Mayor of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation swooped in and took us and gave us to J.P. Morgan Chase for a song. Right. Change is there all the time. It's so, with us all the time. I used to work for GE. This, when I was there, this is a long time ago, they said, only 5% of the products that GE was producing when they got started is what they produce now, so everything has changed totally. That is true. And you're not the only one. I'm guessing there's others in the room who have been through change in organizations, right? I, had, uh, I worked for a company for five years and I lived in bosses during the five years. Wow. I stayed in the same position. You didn't change, I but didn't change everything bosses. around you did. And with each new manager, I suspect there were new challenges. Absolutely. Yeah. My very first experience in change with organizations was even before I got started in full-time employment, even before I had earned my bachelor's degree. My first degree was in secondary education. I was learning to be a science teacher, middle school, high school. And uh, during my student teaching experience, there was a, a wise, sage gentleman who had obviously been through a lot uh, in his years of teaching, and I said, you know, with all the different changes in education, the different fads that come through, the different practices, how do you, how do you survive this? And I'll never forget his response. He says, well, look at me now. Here's the current situation. Imagine the wave of whatever coming my way. I duck down, and I watch it go past, and then I sit up again. And it's worked for me. I <laughs> said, so, all right. But sometimes we don't get that often. Sometimes we uh, we kind of need to deal with it, right? Uh, I'll make another comment. Sure. You know, I grew up where I was a young kid working on a farm. Now I go back to the fields in Utah where I worked on farms and the homes. Right. And the fathers are making food. That is correct. And, and that is a common phrase, right? That the only constant in life is, is what? It's change. Exactly. So I am curious, of the experiences you had in change in organizations, uh, I've already kind of got a sense of uh, what you thought about them. What have you thought about those experiences? Have they been good? Have they been 
not so good? Have there been successes or some good, some not? That's a fair answer. Just mainly because even though I'm coaching, uh -huh. but it's just the process that uh, myself, my colleagues, and people of my level of employment and organization experience okay. through, the, through the change process. So uh, I'm going to repeat it just so everyone hears that the experience Daniel has had is he's all for change. He understands the need to constantly improve. We're always looking to get better and better, right? But the way it's happened has been less than stellar. Is that Absolutely. about it? All right. Does that sum up pretty much everyone else's experience? All right. I wanted to get a, just a sense of that as we move forward, because I didn't think I was the only one who, had, uh, who thought that. In preparing for this presentation and, and some other writing I've been doing, I wanted to look at the literature that was out there in the area of change management. And for the most part, I found that there were four areas uh, that most of the articles would land in. And you see them up here. By the way, I'm going to leave my business card with anyone who wants it. So if you're interested in getting a copy of this PowerPoint, I can certainly send it to you afterwards. So you don't need to be frantically taking too many notes. Uh, I'll be sure and send this to you if you'd like it. Four areas where the literature falls into are uh, interpersonal elements, uh, theories, concepts, and models, components-based work and, of course, case studies. And there's going to be some overlap in there, as you'll see. Before I get into the model I have in mind for change management, how to make something actually stay changed in an organization, I can just quickly go through some examples of articles in each one of these categories. Uh, because it, it's, it's all over the place. But even, even with it being all over the place, kind of comes down to these four things, which I think is key in understanding what might really make a difference for change and, and helping change stay in place with organizations. Now, in the area of interpersonal elements, basically this is talking about communication, about how information is disseminated. That might be touching a little bit on what you were talking about, Daniel, when it comes to how communication is made or not made, right? The most ironic thing I've ever experienced, I was working with a, a school that had night classes. And those night classes went from like 5 to 10 p.m. And you're like, holy crap, who's trying to teach at 10 p.m.? Well, these guys weren't having a great time of it. And so they needed to change to a model that was maybe a little bit in class every week with more online time. They call it a hybrid uh, type teaching in the, in the industry, right? And uh, I was working in a degree program that was uh, organizational development. And I was working with some of the professors there in organizational development and change management. These were guys who taught regularly on the topic of change management. And they were going through a change in the organization. And the biggest irony I will ever, ever remember is when the organization was talking about making these changes, they were uh, basically not following one single step of what appropriate change management might be. They were just dictating, here's how it's going to happen, here's what's going to happen. The professors themselves weren't asking questions, so there was no two-way dialogue. And uh, in fact, I actually even saw one of them get up and walk out of the meeting. I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a stunt. I thought he was just trying to make a point. We'll see him tomorrow. Oh, he was done. That guy is just so fed up with what was happening, he was done. I thought, wow, there's change not done correctly. But this gentleman who was teaching the importance of being flexible, of, of managing change correctly, couldn't handle the change. I thought, wow, that's a lesson for everybody. Anyway, uh, Schlosser talks about grassroots efforts uh, going on in, uh, and how with the OSU, in this case, Ohio State University library system, uh, it was the individuals themselves who undertook the, uh, the effort. They didn't leave it to the leaders to do it. <coughs> they initiated grassroots effort and had success in that. McClellan speaks of overseeing, or rather observing, uh, change effort in a uh, in an art college, a college of art, and uh, it didn't go well. And he found that the reason it didn't go well is because the discourse among the faculty and the management just wasn't right. I mean, that's the simplification of the situation. McClellan was a lot of big words to explain it, but the bottom line is communication wasn't good, so the change effort simply did not sit. Now, 
not surprisingly, uh, Levasseur, not a research-based article at all. He just says, if you involve people, things are likely to go better. Well, <laughs> duh. But that's, that's what he said. He got published for it, so I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, but that's the interpersonal piece, you know, handling communication, handling issues, uh, dissemination of information, things like that. The second area where things fall into is the theories, concepts, and models. And you see them listed here. And this, by the way, is just a small taste. Uh, the, I've just listed three of them up here. Uh, transitional, appreciative intelligence, complexity theory. They're about every leadership theory or model you can think of. It's been written up in terms of change management. But um, most of that writing is only, well, it's not empirical. As Kirchhenk and Collins uh, state, the weakness of most of these articles, most of this, well, it's not research. So I can't say most of it's research because most of it's not research. It's just ideas about how to apply X model into change management. And, and you consider this a weakness, and I think it is too. If it doesn't provide any, if there's no evidence that an application of a certain model might work, then where do you get off actually promoting that idea, right? Except that you know, they do it, and it gets published. So again, kudos for that. Yes? I used to work for the Clinton Brand Industry, and I remember they have a factory up in the Northeast that had these young guys come in, I forgot which organization a lot of mechanization in the factories that they were doing. And they did it themselves without involving the people who were running it. Right. I forgot how much the young know, man's paid for that. I can tell you, it was $700,000. Right. When it was said and done, the people had to buy into it. And, um, it just... We're going to get into that. Mark was mentioning how it changed in an organization with uh, people bringing in equipment and other processes, I assume. They came, did their thing, and left, right? And the change, as you said, didn't go so well. Before they left, they were kicked out because they, they, were, just, they were just frustrated the people who were running it. And then Daniel and Brad talked to them and said, how about this? And said, we're so fed up, this won't work. And we're not, nobody was it. They hadn't bought into it at all. Right. And we're going to touch on that heavily as we get into the hour here. Another component, excuse me, another element of literature, another area where a lot of the change management uh, articles land is simply focusing on one part of an organization. Uh, and here are a few examples. Harris, uh, by the way, is uh, had an article in 2010 that focused on the Pierce County Transit System. It's like a three-page training development is more a trade magazine. It's not. It is referee. There are editors, um, but it's it's research light. I guess is what you'd call it. Um, and. And they focused on how the leadership team and the training team got together to improve efficiency, which is awesome. But again, it's just an example of the type of literature there is out there, which really focuses on one part of an organization. Here we have also examples of IT or HR or facilities. Every type of industry that's out there and that has peer-reviewed journals will have articles about change management in that field. I, I, I could just can't cite them all, but that's what I found as I was looking at them. It's a topic which, which obviously hits every industry, right? And certainly in higher education and in teaching, we're not immune to it. Last year is case studies. Now, in this arena, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, of many of the articles that you can find in the other areas are case studies. And two of them are up here. I mentioned the Harris uh, example already, which focused only on the leadership of the training team. It was a case study of the Pierce County uh, Transit System. Schlosser, which I mentioned in connection with Ohio State University Libraries, was a case study. So there was some overlap there. It was a case study on how involved, to involve the people, and yet it was still a case study. And there's a couple others up here as well. What I gleaned from all this is that you can pretty much Though not too many articles do it, and I haven't heard too many people speak of it, as far as I can tell, uh, this much is clear. That any organization to have the best chance of lasting transformational change has to include, uh, well, let's say, consideration of and execution from a majority of the organization. 
both the purpose, the purpose has to be there, the components, the right components have to be involved, and of course the people as well. It's not just, let's let the leaders do it, as you said. Let's not let a third party come in and do it and then leave. Uh, asking the people to be involved certainly is a good part of it, but without leadership being buying into it, how far is that going to get? So we're going to dive into this. As far as I can tell, and here it is in bullet form, uh, success factors for lasting transformation have these four elements to it. Clear and persuasive business reasons. I use the word business. Um, let's consider higher ed or any, any organization. Whatever their mission, whatever their goals are, that's their business. Nonprofit, government entity, uh, a non government organization, any organization has to have a clear and persuasive reason for making the change. Change for change's sake will never stay in, never stay in place. It just won't. The second item on there is committed leadership, and we already know from personal experience, I'm sure, if leadership isn't behind it, what's the success rate going to be? We know the answer, right? Growth efforts are not programmatic, or not just programmatic, but embedded. I'm going to explain that in, a, in more detail in a moment. For now, I'll just introduce the idea. And that last piece, which we've already discussed, full employee buy-in and engagement, as Mark's already mentioned. Uh, just like if the leaders aren't on board, it can only go so far. If the people aren't on board, things will only go so far. This is, not, this is what experience tells us, and the literature bears this out. So we put this in this form. Basically, you take this as a checklist for anything you see happening in any organization and say, is it there or not? And if it's not there, what can we do to get it there? Because these, these are the four elements that are going to matter. I'm going to bring you in here an example from one of the latest trainings I did uh, with an insurance company, a major uh, national carrier, uh, asked uh, for some help in their diversity and inclusion group in the Western United States. They were looking to just kind of get re-energized about their work within the company. And they asked me to take a little bit of time and help them focus on maybe what their actions should be. And, and so I brought this first part, you know, not the literature, but this concept right here uh, to them that, as far as I can tell, these four elements need to be there. And then I asked them for a little bit of homework. I said, what do you got that can show me these elements are in place with what you want to do? And before the seminar, they sent to me this, this piece of material. I said, well, here's our goal as a diversion, diversion, diversity and inclusion group, right? They said, integrating diversity and inclusion into our culture is fundamental to our success as a company. Diversity and inclusion are crucial to attraction and retention, agent employee development, product development and services, customer satisfaction. We engage the diverse talents, backgrounds, and experience of our agents and employees. Why? To support our business objectives. Now, as far as a business is concerned, how well does this speak to the need to be diverse and inclusive in their efforts, both in, internally and who they work to serve outside of their company, their client base. I'd say that's a pretty strong motive, right, to help a business go forward. So the idea of tying the purpose to the change effort, in this case, I'd say check, right, it's there. If we don't do a good job of understanding our clients and including them in any way we can, we're sunk. Makes sense to me. The second item on the list is committed leadership. So I'll ask the question. Well, they need to be present and active. That's obvious. How do you know if you're getting that? Is that an obvious question? Maybe the answer is obvious. I want to hear it from you anyway. How do you know if your leadership in an organization is, in fact, committed to whatever change is being discussed? No, not discussed. Desire to be implemented. How do you know? I haven't heard from the quarterback there yet, so feel free. 
the leaders are modeling the change. Okay. Good, good. <laughs> I'll, I'll what say, else? I'd say the information about the changes coming from the leaders themselves, say the people who make the ultimate decision makers. Okay. Not, not the folks who report, not the folks who, uh, who report to those individuals who know they would pass on that information like a broken telephone there. It's like you hear it from the decision makers at the end of the day consistently. Okay. Thank you. Daniel's words were the message is coming from the leaders. It's not coming from uh, you know, two or three layers down. It's coming from the top. That's certainly an indicator as well. Consistently. Oh. Consistently, Consistently. right. Consistently. Not one message to not kick it off, yes. but uh, involved. constantly involved. I say up to three times in three different ways. Three times. Communicating change effectively, you can communicate at least three times in three different ways. At least. At least three times, three different ways. Well, I say they have to organize one or two together, part of the organization that works. That's right. Part of it. Maybe. Not maybe. Of course they might delegate, but delegate does not mean, you know, just kick it out the door, let somebody else handle it forever and ever, right? You stay in touch with the people you delegate to. Always. All right, so that's how it's done. And you're right. I didn't need, I didn't feel the need to get into that personally. It's, that's the way it is. So if you're part of this change, if you're overseeing the change, it's not good enough to just delegate that. So I don't know if part of it, though, but you're spiritual, you know, spiritual speech to it. You mentioned speech to it. Of course. It. it takes time. It takes persistence. It takes effort. All right, now let's talk about embedded. I promised earlier on that I would explain this a little bit more.
or funds run out, what happens to that quote change? Turns out. It's like that's what well we did that one time, right? They pile it onto the list of things all attempted but not stuck. That's what we're trying to avoid here. Let's see. So I'm going to get back to the slide that we start with. More diverse in this case, uh, for the example, diversity and inclusion is linked to the core business strategy, the more apparent and natural the impact will be. All right? So again, going back to the purpose for the change, if that is genuine to what we are here to do, and that, that connection is logical, it makes sense, and everybody understands, then the success rates go up. Right? And you infuse that, you embed that through activities in multiple areas. This is a short list. Multiple areas where this gets spoken of. We mean it when we say it. This is what we want here. All right? Then it becomes natural. Then everybody gets it. Right? It's, it becomes embedded. Now, the last item on the list is full employee engagement. Um, the biggest challenge. Uh, right? Getting buy-in from the majority of people will always be the biggest Task. And that was spoken of this morning, right? Our keynote speaker said there will always be people, the naysayers, the, the devil's advocates, right? They're there. And then that's not bad. We just have to work to try and get everybody on board, and that's what leaders do. Sherman Horn pointed out that in organizations, in any organization, there's going to be eight elements. Too often, I think, that organizations will work with, excuse me, leaders will work with the part of the organization that is easiest for them to work with. And if that's all they focus on, then they fall short of the mark because depending on the size of the other parts of the organization, to the degree they ignore those parts, that's the degree they're likely to not succeed. Okay? So when we talk about people, we need to consider all eight elements. But those top three on the list, uh, purpose, objectives, and technology, these are kind of set for people already. The purposes are laid out by the leaders of the organization, as are the objectives. And the IT, the technology of an organization, is, is it's kind of already happening. The question there is just how do, we, how do we leverage the technology to advance our change effort? What do we want to make stick, right? And how can we leverage our technology to make that happen? The lower five on the list, I mean, lower meaning just compared to those up on the top of the picture, <laughs> not ranking them. But the others on the list, and they're written in black on the far uh, side of the room there. Strategy, structure, culture, tasks, and people. These are the five elements that can be, that are not prescribed, they're not already placed, but they can be worked with when it comes to change. There are tasks that can be done. There are ways they can be involved. And these are the five I would submit should be focused on when it comes to looking at change. So I've written them out here in this form. Again, they're on the board. And remember, you can get the PowerPoint if you want to just leave me, uh, send me a note after the session. What to do in each of these areas is spelled out right there. Change is really a big deal, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's the only constant. That's All right. Now let's talk about involving people. There are six actions, at least six, uh, that can involve people in all of these different areas, in all of these different ways. Well, I wrote the six on the board over there as well. The parts of the organization and the way that people are worked with. Obviously, we do need to educate and communicate. That was spoken of earlier. Unfortunately, that's where a lot of the change efforts stop. It's very one way. It can't be that way. There has to be participation, involvement, facilitation, and support. And this is not, by the way, just with team members. This is where the leaders need to be part of it as well. This is what makes the difference between a change effort that has a chance and a change effort that doesn't. All right? If they just assign it out and stay in their offices and don't do much more than just get the reports, 
the likelihood of any chain staying in place is, well, it's diminished. What was the number of years that our keynote speaker said, minimum five years, five to seven years in any organization of any size? I was like, I was in the back going, amen, all right? Because three years is just enough time for, for a new CEO to exercise their stock options and leave, all right? They make changes that will up the stock value. If we're talking business and industry. And they'll exercise their stock options and leave. Have they made any real lasting change? No, they haven't. Have they done perhaps more damage than good to the organization? Quite possibly. Right? They've left it ready to be bought out by somebody else is what they've done. All right, now in education, we have opportunities to make change as well. These strategies need to be involved at all levels in order to see that happen. So there's the list of four items that I consider are tenants for lasting change, uh, trans what I call transformational change. Now, this conference is about leadership and education, right? Teaching leadership, right? So the strategy, as promised in the description, is you would get a strategy for teaching leadership. And what I would do is what I've just done. I would give this information and this kind of concept as a, just a platform of information. And with that in mind, uh, after you know, plenty of conversation around what this is, uh, it would be time to implement that. And in my way of thinking, case studies are a great way to do that. As an example, how am I doing for time? Uh, All right. We will not go through this case study. <laughs> but I will show you a case study. And by the way, this is a relatively easy case study. It doesn't have a lot of internal strife. It's more about uh, how a team, how an organization, a school in this case, might plan for a change and then work through a change. In this case, a school that started Decades ago, planned for only 500, now has 1,500 students, right? And as many schools have done, especially private schools who aren't as regulated as public schools, they'll have the main school that was donated once upon a time, but then they'll have a lot of temporary buildings all over the property, right? Well, and that's that starts looking pretty ugly. And so here's Marshall Academy, they want to change. And the school board, the leaders, have decided it's time for a new building, right? So wisely, they are not going to just say, although some boards would, it's time to start a fundraising effort, and off they go by themselves. No, in this case, they really need to leverage the whole organization. So the assignment to a class would be, considering the five organizational components presented, and by that I mean strategy, structure, culture, tasks, and people, develop for each area for each of those areas, strategies and actions that could be done for a successful building fund and a changeover, right? Using the six communication skills to involve the people, using in each area of that organization what can be done. And then of course, for any change effort, there will be resistance. And, and keep that in mind as well. I won't get into that element. There's plenty of writing on that. But it's there. And like I said, even our keynote speaker today mentioned it. It is just part of the change management world. And she was exactly right. When you get voices in the, in, among the team members who are ready to take up that banner for you, you know you're winning the game. So there's how I would teach this. This is how I have taught this. Helping people understand what really makes a difference between change that is just an effort and change that actually sticks is through case studies. Now the application. So for the practitioner, I, I showed you how I would teach it through case study. The application for the person who's actually in change management, the consultants, um, basically follow the same model. Keeping that checklist in mind, and the five areas of the organization you can work with, and the six different strategies for communication and working with the people, 
at all levels. Uh, that's how it's done. I basically consider it building a house, right? Where the leaders are the foreman, the organization components, these five elements, are the building blocks, and the people are the mortar that are going to hold everything together. Because again, without the people on board, it's not going to stick. It doesn't even have a chance really of starting if you don't have the people on board. Getting the people on board is a whole other session. We'll deal with that some other day. If you have any questions. No, I like this. This is this is kind of the you've been consulting. This is the consultant's conundrum for change, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, it's very well done. Thank you. Well, thank you. I have a comment for you for getting the people on board. Yes. I noticed that you have like full team buy-in. And I have always, when I talk to change leadership, I teach that there are three categories of people. If those that will allow to change very easily and very quickly and get behind you to see kind of the same vision that you see. You have those that are ambivalent or more doubtful, and you have those that don't have how, no way, there's no way I'm going along with this. Right. Take the ambivalent and the doubtfuls and use them because they're a tremendously valuable resource. Why are you ambivalent and why are you doubtful? And what you'll find is they may have some really good ideas about how to change things in quite a way, and you can adjust it and change it and fix it, make it even stronger than it is. Doing that, you went over the ambivalence and doubtfuls, and you have a critical mass of people who are with you. Then you got a really strong cohort. That's yeah. exactly right. And you sort of kind of have to still deal with the know how's the way. <laughs> but that's a relatively smaller bunch, right? Smaller. Even our keynote speaker mentioned that. Go ahead and face the fear. Go to the people that you expect to be the naysayers. And say, all right, here's what I'm thinking. Hit me, right? <laughs> That was great counsel. Again, I was back to going, hey, man, sister. All right. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you.